Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. Today's topic of discussion is bottle jacks and manual backup pumps. Our objective is to examine an application of hydraulic principles and components in the form of bottle jacks and manual backup pumps. This introductory application example takes a look at extremely simple hydraulic systems you may already have experience with. Later lectures will examine increasingly sophisticated applications of hydraulic principles and components. Bottle jacks are in effect complete hydraulic systems integrated in a single housing. They are force multiplication systems and that repeated low force strokes of the manual jack handle result in the exertion of high force for a small distance. Such a simple hydraulic system can allow a child to lift a heavy truck provided the necessary level of adult supervision. A bottle jack includes a reservoir from which a small manually actuated piston sucks in fluid through an intake check valve. When the manually actuated piston is displaced upwards, a region of increasing volume is formed, resulting in partial vacuum conditions inside the barrel. Fluid at atmospheric pressure in the reservoir is pulled in through the intake check valve into the barrel. Given the orientation of the outlet check valve, it remains closed, thereby providing a clear and definite separation between the input and output. In summary, on the upstroke, the intake check valve is open and the outlet check valve is closed. When the manually actuated piston is displaced downwards, a region of decreasing volume is formed, resulting in pressure being exerted upon the confined fluid. The area of the manually actuated piston is small, resulting in the comparatively small force exerted by the operator being concentrated on a much smaller area. Given pressure equals force over area, the exertion of this force on a small area results in comparatively high pressure. Fluid at high pressure is pushed into the system through the outlet check valve. Given the orientation of the inlet check valve, it remains closed, thereby providing a clear and definite separation between input and output. In summary, on the downstroke, the intake check valve is closed and the outlet check valve is open. The high pressure outlet of the manually actuated piston is transferred to the comparatively larger surface area of a cylinder that serves as a force multiplier. This larger cylinder is in effect a single acting ram that actively extends with hydraulic force and as we'll learn, only passively retracts using the weight of the applied load. Due to the passive nature of retraction, the single acting ram has no necessity for a rod end volume. However, may include a drain port to channel away any accumulated fluid that has leaked past the piston, thereby preventing exertion of a retarding back pressure. Given Pascal's law states that pressure in a confined fluid is exerted equally and undiminished in all directions, this same pressure is exerted on the larger surface area of the single acting ram, P1 equals P2. Given force equals P2 times A2, this results in comparatively high force exerted by the single acting ram. Algebraically rearranging these two equations yields that the input force of the manually actuating piston has in effect been multiplied by the ratio of the functional area of the single acting rod over the area of the manually actuated piston. F2 equals A2 over A1 times F1. Here's an example. Given a manually actuated piston with a half inch diameter, means the manually actuated piston has a surface area of approximately 0.1963 square inches. Assuming the single acting ram has a diameter of three inches, means the single acting ram has a functional surface area of approximately 7.069 square inches. If 40 pounds of force is applied to the manually actuated piston, this results in a pressure of approximately 203.8 psi being experienced inside the confined fluid. When this same pressure of 203.8 psi is exerted on the comparatively larger surface area of the single acting ram, this results in a force of approximately 1,440.3 pounds force being exerted by the single acting ram. Again, one could shortcut the intermediary Pascal's law calculations to directly arrive at the result in force as being multiplied by the ratio of the functional area of the single acting rod over the area of the manually actuated piston. Although you probably won't remember this shortcut, that and I find the intermediate pressure calculation satisfying. Given the same pressure experienced by both cylinders, and given a 36 time increase in functional surface area, is it any wonder that exerted force increased a factor of 36 times? This remarkable increase in force may come as a surprise to those unaccustomed to force multiplication systems seemingly violating long-held principles of energy conversion. It does, however, come at a price, notably distance. 
energy is force times distance. Given a 100% efficient system in which energy input equals energy output, an obvious oversimplification, the distance over which the increased force is applied must be decreased by this same amount. Assuming the manually actuated piston has a travel length of 6 inches, each full 6 inch stroke displaces the single actor ram only 6 inches over 36, or 1 -sixth of an inch, or 0.1667 inches. Therefore, it would take six six-inch strokes of the manually actuated piston to displace the single-acting ram only one inch. To displace the single-acting ram a full 12 inches, exerting 1,440 pounds of force, would necessitate a total of 72 40-pound six-inch strokes. Do you see what's happening here? Distance is being traded for force. Repeated low-force, long-distance strokes are being exchanged for high force, small distance movement. If you think about it, this is the hydraulic equivalent to a step down gearbox where speed is traded for torque. Assuming 100% efficiency, this is my preferred method for solving displacement of the single acting ram. However, other methods exist that illustrate the minutia of the underlying phenomenon. The distance differential between the two cylinders is routed in the volumetric differences between the manually actuated piston and the single acting ram. Given the smaller functional area of the manually actuated piston, full displacement of the manually actuated piston results in only a small volume of high pressure fluid introduced into the larger single acting ram. Given the larger functional area of the single acting ram, the same volume of high pressure fluid displaces the larger cylinder only a small vertical distance. A fitting analogy is pouring a cylindrical glass containing 8 ounces of water into a circular swimming pool. The volume of the swimming pool does increase by 8 ounces, however, the level only infinitesimally increases since this small 8 ounce volume is spread over the super large surface area. When the manually actuated piston is displaced 6 inches, this introduces approximately 1.178 cubic inches into the larger single acting ram. V1 equals V2. Given the same volume is spread over the larger surface area, one can rearrange the volume formula to solve for H2. Solving for height, we again arrive at 0.1667 inches. Moving beyond the force multiplication theory behind a bottle jacks operation, you note the single acting ram is actively extended with hydraulic power and only passively retracts using the weight of the lifted object. Ordinarily, a bottle jack provides for controlled descent of a lifted object using a meter out retraction flow control arrangement. When an operator intends to lift an object, the manually adjustable flow control valve between the cap end of the single acting ram and reservoir is kept fully closed. No alternate path for flow exists and any fluid introduced to the single acting ram goes to extending the ram. When an operator intends to lower an object in a controlled fashion, the manually adjustable flow control valve between the cap end of the single acting ram and reservoir is opened ever so slightly. The narrow restriction provided by the flow control valve does not immediately dump the fluid in the cap end of the reservoir, but rather maintains a sufficient back pressure in the cap end while the lifted object is brought to a controlled stop. An operator can control the rate of descent by throttling the manually adjustable flow control valve open or closed. The more open the valve, the less back pressure exists and the faster the rate of descent. The more closed the flow control valve, the more back pressure exists and the slower the rate of descent. If an operator mistakenly failed to fully close this manually adjustable flow control valve, or if the flow control valve failed to fully seat due to some degraded seal, Note the bottle jack would exhibit reduced force at extension due to the alternate path to tank, and, if the object was lifted, exhibit a downward creep over time as fluid leaked past the flow control valve back to the reservoir. Very often, broken bottle jacks, by the way I'm using quotation marks with my fingers, simply need to have this seal inspected, or an operator has simply failed to fully close the manual adjustable flow control valve completely. Finally. Bottle jacks additionally include some form of rudimentary pressure relief. Ordinarily, this is not some fancy pilot operated pressure relief valve, but rather a simple check valve with a heavy bias spring that forces the poppet to the seat in ordinary operating conditions. 
When pressure-induced force sufficient to unseat the poppet is experienced due to the single acting ram reaching the limits of travel or attempting to lift an object beyond its capacity, the check valve with a heavy bias spring cracks open, provides an alternate path to tank, thus relieving pressure. Crude, but inexpensive and effective. You note the capacity of a bottle jack is directly proportional to the physical size of the jack, since input power, i.e. human muscle, has a practical limit. For this reason, a jack designed to lift a heavy truck that tops out at 20 tons is substantially larger than one designed to lift a Ford Festiva, the only car ever designed to comfortably fit half a human being. The increased capacity is directly proportional to the increased area offered by the larger single acting ram. Finally, bottle jacks include other ancillary features, notably filler ports to the reservoir and seals. The filler port allows an operator to replenish any oil lost due to leakage. A bottle jack that fails to fully extend probably just needs to have the reservoir replenished. Very often, bottle jacks are constructed such that the single acting ram actually sits inside an encompassing reservoir that surrounds the ram, hence the name bottle. Note simple bottle jacks don't filter or condition the fluid. For this reason, old bottle jacks might require a simple fluid exchange to extend their life. The seals in a bottle jack are designed to prevent leakage between the dynamically moving ram and the housing, as well as static seals inside the body for components that do not move relative to one another. Since there's such simple constructions, often the only thing that can go wrong with bottle jacks is the progressive degradation of the seals. As long as the seals hold up, or are replaced when and if they ever go bad, a bottle jack should provide many years of service. Variations of bottle jacks exist that perform similar functions with subtle variations. For example, consider the foot-operated hydraulic pump common to some hydraulic tools like pipe and tube benders, porta powers, or hydraulically operated knockout punches. The foot-operated pumps are essentially a bottle jack that is operated with your foot instead of your hand. Given the ergonomics of a foot-operated pump, an operator can exert sufficiently more force on a smaller piston, and as a result, the larger piston will experience more force than a manually operated pump of the same size. For this reason, manually operated bottle jacks often include a removable handle that acts as a force multiplication lever. Bottle jacks are simple manually actuated hydraulic force multiplication systems integrated into a single housing. These same functions can also be included in a larger hydraulic system on an individual basis to perform emergency or backup functions for test or troubleshooting purposes. Allow me to demonstrate. Consider a basic hydraulic system used to brake a rotating shaft on some piece of machinery. The brake assembly consists of a caliper that houses a spring extended hydraulically retracted cylinder that pushes on a brake pad, which in turn pushes on a disc affixed to a rotating shaft. The single cylinder system is a floating caliper design that is designed to move axially with respect to the shaft, however remains fixed radially. This allows the floating caliper to grip the disc despite thickness variations or warp, however when applied, applies a counter torque to slow or stop the rotating shaft. Note the extending cylinder rod does not actually make contact with the disc or rather brake pads formed of a sacrificial high friction surface makes the connection. The pads themselves are consumable items and low level maintenance on braking systems often calls for the inspection and replacement of the pads. You note the cylinder actuating the braking mechanism is spring extended and hydraulically retracted. This means in its deactivated state, this system keeps the brake applied. This is often known as a fail safe braking system and that loss of either pump pressure, or if the pilot electrical system ever failed to send a signal to the solenoid actuated directional control valve, the brake would be applied only when both the pump is functional and the directional control valve is shifted into the activated position will the brake be removed. While desirable for some applications, very often the fail safe nature of such a system needs to be overridden to perform some maintenance or repair procedures. For example, changing the brake pads or performing a shaft alignment when the pump is broken or when the pilot electrical system is not functioning. For this reason, consider the inclusion of a manual backup pump. The manual backup pump is in effect only the manually actuated piston portion of a bottle jack. 
when the existing spring-extended hydraulic retracted cylinder forms the business end of the force multiplication system. Additionally, note the inclusion of several check valves, an additional pressure relief valve, and a manual override on the solenoid actuated directional control valve. When a technician is confronted with either a busted pump or an obstinate electrical pilot system that refuses to energize the solenoid actuated directional control valve, they can now retract the cylinder and remove the brakes and perform the necessary maintenance or repair procedure. To do so, the technician manually overrides the solenoid operated directional control valve and starts madly pumping away on the manual backup handle. When sufficient pressure induced force exists, the cylinder retracts and removes the brakes. Now the shaft can be manually rotated into the desired position and the necessary procedure performed. Upon completion, the manual override can be released on the solenoid operated valve to lock the shaft in place using the spring applied brakes. By manually overriding the solenoid actuated valve into the activated position and repeatedly actuating the manual handle of the backup pump, the technician has in effect taken place of both the pilot operated electrical system and the motor driven pump. Note the additional pressure relief valve serves to limit the pressure as provided by the manual backup pump leg only. This prevents a pump happy technician from over pressurizing the system with too many repeated strokes. Additionally, note the check valves prevent both pumps from interfering with one another during normal or backup operation. All right, that's about it. In conclusion, we examined a simple application of force multiplication and meter out flow control principles in the form of bottle jacks and manual backup pumps. Later lectures will examine increasingly sophisticated applications of hydraulic principles and components. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.